I said, why don't you think about a, <clears throat> think about a girl who's in uh, high school. Uh, she's got uh, three siblings, um, lots of friends. She's on the dance team. She has a, a part-time job. Uh, her parents, uh, they love her. Now, if you ask this girl, and this girl is like surrounded by people all day, if you ask this girl like how she would describe herself, uh, one of the things that she would say is that uh, she's lonely. And the reason that she's lonely is not because she's not around people. The reason that she is lonely is because uh, there's just no one that really understands her. Yeah, there's no one that listens to her hopes. There's no one that listens to her dreams. Uh, there's no one that listens to her fears. You know, so even though she's surrounded by people, she's lonely. Now, I want you to think about a, a man, and he gets home from work. And, and his life has totally changed in the last few years. He's got a couple of kids. One of them's in college now, and one has moved on to uh, her career. Uh, what happens uh, you know, at night as he gets home, and his marriage has recently ended, and his uh, loneliness is a little bit different than her loneliness. His loneliness is uh, the loneliness of isolation. Um, this is really difficult for him. What used to be a house that was full of people is now a house that is empty. And if you could ask him how he would describe his life, the word that he would use is lonely. Uh, there's another person I want you to think about. She's a young mom. She's got a, a daughter. Let's say that the daughter's in first grade and the other one's four years old. And she stays home with this daughter, her husband. Uh, she's in a relationship with him. But, but he's busy. He works really hard. And you know, she uh, uh, does the dinner thing. She cleans up. She gets the kids ready for bed. She puts the kids to bed. Um, and then she goes and she lays in bed with her husband. He's got his computer out. He's working on some email that he needs to get done before the meeting tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. And even though she's within like a foot of somebody, like literally, she's just like laying right next to him. Um, if you could ask her to describe herself in one word, um, guess what that word would be? It would be lonely. You know, she doesn't have anyone to share her life with, even though she's right next to somebody. Now, we have just, uh, uh, well, think about this, like, I think today we get this thing, um, and it's different than it's been in the past. I think we have this thing where we're alone together. I mean, it's almost like a paradox. It sounds like an oxymoron, but um, I think many of you know all too well uh, what it is that I'm talking about. We're alone together. Now, we just finished this uh, sermon series called Be Rich. You know, so we looked at what it meant for three or for five weeks, what it meant to be rich. Like, we're going to be rich in generosity. We're going to be rich... Uh, in good deeds, we're going to be rich in our relationship with God. Now, today I'm going to tell you how to be poor. Uh, I'm going to tell you how to be poor, and I think uh, the way that we're going to be poor, um, and I'm not talking about like, you know, no change in your pockets, no money in your wallet. The way to be really poor in life um, is to experience loneliness. Now, loneliness, uh, it's not good. It's really interesting. The first uh, human issue that God dealt with in the Bible uh, it was in Genesis chapter 2, so we're a whole chapter and a half into the Bible at this point. And God finally says something that's not good. And guess what that was? It is not good for man to be alone. So listen to uh, what God says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Now, God identified this is not being good. There's been many since, and there's been uh, many that were probably more important and more often. But the first thing uh, that God says is, then the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. Now, I want you to think about this. This is the way that we're wired. This is the way that we're created. This is our DNA. So when a baby is born, okay, when a baby is born, like a little six-pound baby or the eight-pound baby, this baby needs another person to survive. Without the help of other people, this baby simply will not make it. Now, um, Think about this, like many of us are getting to the age uh, now where um, we're actually taking care of our parents. Now, there comes a point um, near death when the parents need the baby, who's now an adult, to help them survive. So something at birth and something we experience at death, and it's going to be something that we experience every time in between, that we need each other. We are not created to live in isolation. We're created to live in community. One of the uh, things that... Um, uh, Mother Teresa said, and think about Mother Teresa, where she lived and what she, uh, what she did. Um, she was a missionary uh, in India. 
Um, so think about this. She saw the poorest of the poor. She saw death, disease, and dysfunction at its absolute worst. And listen to what she says. Um, she says, the most terrible poverty, so she's seen the poorest of the poor, the most terrible poverty is loneliness and the feeling of being unloved. You know, so I, I, I think that we're probably on the same page this morning. I think that you believe and maybe you've even experienced that loneliness is like this, uh, this terrible poverty. Now today, we're going to start a new series. It's called uh, Christmas in the Movies. And we're going to look at some of the things that we deal with uh, during the month of December leading up to the holidays, uh, you know, specifically Christmas. And, and I think, you know, for many of us who struggle with loneliness, I think that this is going to become even uh, more accentuated, um, you know, during this month. Maybe someone we love is a long way away or someone we love has uh, died and we're experiencing more loneliness than what we usually experience. You know, next week we're going to look at stress, uh, you know, in December that just uh, peaks for many of us. Uh, the week after that, we're going to look at comparing ourselves to others. The week after that, we're going to look at uh, you know, how to have some uh, healthier relationships, maybe especially with people that we uh, you know, don't get to see all the time. And then on Christmas Eve, of course, we'll look at how to have that relationship with uh, Christ himself. Now, we're uh, starting off today with uh, the Grinch, um, the Grinch who stole Christmas. We think about loneliness and we think about Grinch, and here is part of his story. All right, so do you hear that thing he said? He said, I guess I could use a little uh, social interaction. You know, I think that's going to be, I mean, I know that's going to be the case for uh, all of us because God says in Genesis uh, 2.17, it is not good for people to be alone. In 2010, there was this groundbreaking study. They studied over 100,000 people. Uh, they merged together about 100 different studies on uh, why people die, when they die. So they looked at you know, what some of the biggest predictors were, and they kind of knew what they were going into it. But number five uh, would have been lack of physical activity. Uh, this is here in the United States. Number four would have been uh, obesity. Number three would have been smoking. Number two would have been excessive drinking. But do you know what the best predictor is of uh, someone's longe uh, longevity? It's uh, you know, loneliness. You know, loneliness will uh, take time off of our life. Um, more than anything else, and studies have confirmed this uh, over time, time and time again. Uh, right now, and like you know how sometimes I'll have you like I'll raise your hand uh, if something's going on in your life. So like I would say, okay, who's lonely? Raise your hand. And you know, not a single one of you is going to raise your hand. First of all, it's like this negative stigmatism that goes with it. Um, you know, we don't want people to think that we're lonely. So it's really tough to say like how many people are lonely. I've done some research this week, and I found probably as little as one out of every three of us would say, at least in part, we're lonely. Um, some studies would say as many as uh, one half of us would experience that. You know, so basically 33% to 50% of us would say at least some of our life, you know, yeah, we do experience um, some loneliness. Now, if you're in the half to the two-thirds that is not experiencing this right now, that's great. Um, you know, maybe you've dealt with this in the past, but really, in the future, we're going to deal with this, all of us are, even if we're not there right now, because there's demands on our life that are going to change. Uh, there's distance, there's disease, there's dysfunction. And then, you know, at the end, there, there's death. 
like all of us are going to have to deal with loneliness sometime if, if we're not uh, dealing with it now. Uh, all these things are predictable. All these things are relentless. Now, God speaks a lot about community. He speaks a lot about connectedness. He speaks a lot about relationships. Um, he speaks a lot about loneliness. We find some of this uh, in Ecclesiastes chapter 4. We're going to start at verse 7. Uh, Bailey read this uh, a little bit ago. Um, verse 7 says, so the author here, uh, his name is Solomon. Solomon would have been uh, the wealthiest uh, man in the world. Solomon would have been basically surrounded by a lot of people uh, who looked up to him, a lot of people that he would have had power over. So this is, you know, this is autobiographical for him, and he says, I have observed yet another example of something meaningless under the sun. This is the case of a man who was all alone, without child or a brother, who works hard to gain as much wealth as he can. But then he asks himself, who am I working for? Why am I giving up so much pleasure now? It is all so meaningless and depressing. Now, Solomon is aware that you can be very, very wealthy. You can be rich, you know, like rich in the way that the culture looks at, at being rich, and, and, and you can be experiencing poverty. The words that he would use is uh, meaningless and depressed because of the loneliness that exists in our life. So Solomon here, is, he makes no implication otherwise that you know, it's better to be rich in relationships um, than it is to be rich having a lot of money in your pockets. Now, in verse 9, he continues, Two people are better than one, for they can help each other succeed. Uh, that, that's good stuff. Like, for two people are better than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, they can reach out and the other can help. So think about this. Like, the definition of a life-giving relationship. So think about this. Your friendships. Think about, uh, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, with a coworker, whether it's a neighbor, whether it's a spouse, whether it's a cousin, whether it's uh, a, a classmate, a friend, a, a teammate, whatever. The definition of a life-giving relationship uh, is, is something like this. It's when, when two people can become more together than both of them could have become separately. That's the definition of a life-giving relationship, when two people can become more together than both people, both parties, could have become individually by themselves. Now, in verse 10, he continues, when one person falls, the other can reach out and help, but someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two lying close together can keep each other warm, but how can one keep warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. So here, Solomon is making his case for companionship. You know, Solomon, no, he, he would have read Genesis chapter 2 where it said it is not good for people to be alone. Solomon has not only read this in the Bible, he has experienced it in life. And he gives us really three types of uh, companionship. The first is going to be face-to-face -face companionship. Now, we need face-to-face -face companionship. Face-to-face -face companionship, what it says is, I I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to look into your eyes. I'm going to listen to your story. I'm going to share with you part of my story as well. You know, whether it's romantic intimacy or non-romantic intimacy, we need this type of relationship. We need this face-to-face -face intimacy where we can uh, share our story and listen to the story of another, where we can support and encourage, where we can be supported and be encouraged. Now, the next type of intimacy is going to be back-to-back -back intimacy. We see uh, Solomon would have talked about this in verse 12. A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two who stand back-to-back -back can conquer. So what happens here is if um, I'm looking this way, think about like the two Roman soldiers. Do you know how they would have stood? They would have stood like this, and then someone would have had my back to me, and they'd be facing that way. So I can see everything over here, everything over there, and all the way over here. So I am protecting this person because he can't see this stuff, and he's protecting me because you can see over here, over here, and everything over here. So now we're protecting each other. We need this type of intimacy in our life. We need this type of relationship. We need to, I mean, you, you, you've heard the phrase, like, when someone says, you've got my back, like, this is where it comes from. We need basically someone who has got our back. You know, someone who will protect us from the blind spots, someone who will, uh, you know, be watching out for us, uh, you know, and, and look out for us, someone that will have this, like, protective functioning. And then the third one, um, this third type of intimacy is uh, what we call like side-to-side -side intimacy. Now think about this. Like you have a purpose, you have a goal, you have hopes, you have dreams. Now when we have these things, um, we don't want to go it alone. We want someone to take this journey with us. You know, so this is what the side-to-side -side intimacy looks like. We're walking forward together with a shared and a common purpose. 
Again, this can be a romantic relationship. It can be a non-romantic relationship. That doesn't matter. What matters is that we're not alone. Now, one of the things that uh, you have to know, and I want you to hear this this morning, okay? Um, one of the things about loneliness is a crowd is not necessarily company. Okay, so a crowd is not necessarily company. Loneliness and being alone are going to be two totally different things. You know, a person can be surrounded by other people and feel totally alone. You know, inches of physical separation can feel like miles of isolation. So let's just say like you're having a, a, a conversation with somebody. Okay, just a conversation where you're talking and listening. You know, there's a dialogue between two people. Let's maybe say it was like a coworker or a classmate. So yesterday I had one with a neighbor. Um, he was out um, shooting baskets with his kids. Um, I was uh, cleaning my garage. Um, it was a great day for it. And we ended up talking. I was like moving my snowblower and some of the bikes and kind of sweeping up the garage and all that sort of stuff. And I started talking to him. And guess, we actually talked about two things. Guess what we talked about? Can't hear you. What, what did we talk about? Just take a guess. We didn't talk about soccer. We did talk about sports. More specifically, what sport? Football, more specifically, what kind of football? Yeah, it'd be a really interesting conversation today, I hear, but uh, we had the conversation <laughs> yesterday. Now, we also talked about something else. What else did we talk about? All right, so we talked about the weather. Today was going to be like a great day, and yeah, I mean, that was today, yesterday, but uh, you know what I mean. Um, it was a great day yesterday. It wasn't going to be so great today. So we talked about those two things. Now, this was a conversation, but it was not connection. You know, it was, it was small talk. It was, it was polite talk. It was, you know, two guys just kind of shooting the breeze a little bit. Now, what you're seeking in life, um, what you're seeking in life is not conversation, is it? What you're seeking in life is going to be connection. You know, there's another uh, family. I visited them in the church. Uh, I think I visited them on Wednesday at their office. And, you know, I was only there for about 10 or 15 minutes. But during those 10 or 15 minutes, um, you know, what I did is I, I listened to their hopes, I listened to uh, their dreams. You know, we talked about their opportunities and, and their challenges, and they invited me to share you know, some of the things I went through, and, and we, uh, uh, we all prayed together. Now, that was not conversation. That was connection. You know, it, it's something that we seek. Now, we can be in a room. I mean, one of the things I pray is, like, you know, you've come here this morning. We're in a room with hundreds of people. And I really hope and I really pray that there, everyone can just say, you know, there, there's somebody in this room who gets me. You know, there's someone who understands me. There's someone who accepts me just as I am and loves me so much that they're going to help me move to where I want to go. You know, I was sitting on an airplane a couple months ago, and it's one of those flights, you take it and you come back the same day or whatever. And so I sit next to this, so think about this, a crowded airplane. A um, hundred of us were on there. We're all in very tight, close proximity um, so this young girl sits beside me, and about 10 minutes of the flight, she self-reports that she uh, thinks she has to throw up. <laughs> I'm like, I only got one pair of jeans. You can't be throwing up in here. Um, I got to talk to a bunch of people and come home tonight. And I, <laughs> you know, so then she started to share some of her story, how she was out really late the night before. Um, she went to this club and this bar, and you know, she had a friend pick her up because she didn't think she could drive to the airport, and it was like 6 o'clock in the morning, you know. So she said, what are you doing there? And I said, well, I'm, I'm a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, oh. I said, don't worry, we don't judge. We uh, love everybody just like God does. And, um, but think about that. Even like you know, two strangers sitting right next to you. I mean, just because you're surrounded by other people doesn't mean um, that you're lonely. And, and also, I, I would say this, like the cruelest form of loneliness, and I, I really think this is possible for many of us, the cruelest form of loneliness is when we're in close proximity to a loved one and that loved one no longer communicates with us right next to somebody but totally alone now the inverse is going to be true we can be totally isolated and feel very comfortable with who we are how we relate to other people how how it is that we uh relate to god um a person can be in solitude and totally embrace who they are miles of physical separation can seem like inches when it comes to emotional intimacy. Uh, so think about this. Like, think about like solitude. Sol solitude is not necessarily loneliness. Um, 
Solitude serves a very you know, positive function. We talk about this in the church. We talk about Sabbath. I think one of the best things we can do is sometimes you know, isolate ourselves, remove ourselves at least for a little bit and become better. You know, we can pray, we can uh, read the scriptures, we can reflect, we can rest. We're going to be better as rested than we are as tired. We're going to be uh, better restored than we are as broken. You know, God can use these little times of solitude so that we have a deeper connection with other people. So let's, let me get, just give you an example here. Let's say you like, had a really stressful day at work, okay? And you have to drive like 15 minutes before uh, you, know, you pick up kid number one, and it's like 20 minutes more before you pick up kid number two, and it's like 10 minutes more before you get home. So let's say that you have like this 10 or 15 minutes of solitude. This does not have to be loneliness. You know, your prayer, and it, it can be a prayer, and it can be something like this. Um, you yeah, Lord, this was a very hectic day at work. Uh, it was just busy, and I, I feel like a failure, and I got some stuff done. I didn't get what I needed to be done. I didn't think I was treated very well, but um, God, just give me your peace, and you know, bless me with your grace, and help me know that my worth, uh, it doesn't come from this uh, job, but it comes from you, and Lord, I pray that I can be the dad that I need to be for these uh, two girls. And Lord, when I get home, just help me uh, you know, to be a servant and to, uh, to love. Now, just think about that. Like, If you could do something like that um, and take that type of attitude to the rest of your life as opposed to uh, you know, the brokenness and the hurts and the hecticness, you know, here we can see that transformation can happen. Now, what I want us to do... Uh, from now on, and we can do one of two things. And we all know that option B is going to be better than option A. Option A is that you can spend the rest of your life building walls. Now, these walls are going to protect you. These walls, uh, at least in the short term, are going to prevent you from being hurt. But these walls are also going to keep people out. These walls are going to mean that you're going to be alone. Now, that's option number one. I don't think that's a good option. Option number two is that we build bridges. Option number two is that we uh, say, yeah, I'm, I'm going to build a bridge and I'm going to uh, connect you know, to somebody else. It's not going to be easy. Um, yeah, there's going to be some risk that goes along with it. But it's not nearly as risky as building this wall and never having anybody come into my life and being alone forever. So, uh, verse, um, well, let's just look at how to do this. Uh, like trust is a wall. Our distrust is a wall. One of the ways you can build a, a great big wall, and one of the ways you can prevent people from being in a relationship with you and you being in a relationship with them is to build a wall. And one of the ways you build that wall is through tr uh, distrust. It's like, you know, I, I've been hurt before. I'm not going down that road again. Therefore, I'm going to build this big wall, and you're not going to come into my life. Now, trust is going to be the way that we uh, remedy that. Trust says, okay, I'm going to build this bridge. I've been on the bridge before, and it collapsed, and I fell in the water, and I either had to swim to the shore or someone had to rescue me. But I believe what's on the other side of that bridge is more important than my anxiety of crossing this bridge. So let's go back to me and my neighbor. This conversation did not happen, but I'm going to give you an example of a conversation that could happen, okay? Now, we can talk about football, and we can talk about the weather um, until we become like these grumpy old men that only talk about football and weather. Um, we can do that. But, I mean, that, that's like, you know, some distrust there, like I'm not letting him into my life, and, you know, he's not letting me into his, but it, it could actually go like this. He could say, Craig, uh, I just wanted to talk to you for a little bit about something. Um, you know, I got a girl, and like, she's a, she's a teenager now. And, like, I found out that, uh, can you believe this? She has an Instagram account. And, like, she has all these friends, and they write stuff on her thing, and she takes these pictures, and, like, uh, she's text messaging boys, and she cares about how she looks, and she's more interested in makeup uh, than she is in sports. And, um, Craig, I'm just not doing very well with this. Like, I know this is normal, and this happens all the time, but, you know, this is not easy for me, and I'm not asking you to fix my problems because I know you can't. Um, but what I am asking you is just to be there for me sometimes. If uh, you know, I just need someone to talk to, can I uh, you know, come over and we can just chat for a little bit? Or if uh, uh, yeah, I'm just going through a tough spell, is there any way I can just like, call you up and we can, we can chat? 
Like, that takes trust on his part to say something like that. It really does. Because he knows there's a possibility I could go to the other neighbor and I could say, hey, <laughs> you're never going to believe this. this poor sucker over there. His daughter, she's in middle school, she has an Instagram account. And like she's texting boys and she's wearing makeup and, and this, this is not good, you know. And like that's the distrust that I could actually do that. But like there's this reward as well. There's this reward that I won't do that. There's this potential reward that he can come up to me and he can say, you know, Craig, it's not been a good day at all. Like she's going out on her first date in like three hours and I don't know what to do. Like I don't know what to do either, but uh, you know, I'll just be here with you and we'll take this journey together. You can see, so you can build like this uh, wall with distrust, or you can build a bridge with trust. Now, the next one we can look at is uh, uh, selfishness. That builds a wall really quickly. You know, just demanding your own way, having things uh, your way all the time. Um, servanthood, on the other hand, builds a bridge. See, I talked about this the last couple of weeks. So I'm going to talk about it the next few weeks as well. What would it look like this December, during this time of Advent, if we saw ourselves primarily as servants and not consumers? What would it look like for us if we were defined by our servanthood rather than our consumerism? Now, I'm not saying don't go out and buy anything. I mean, that's not going to be practical. But I'm going to say, what would it look like if we were primarily servants of other people? You know, selfishness is going to build these great big walls. Servanthood is going to build a bridge. Yeah, one of the things, I don't usually tell this, but one of the things I always do on Christmas Eve um, is I always go to people's houses that can't make it to a Christmas Eve service. You know, sometimes they're shut in, sometimes they're in a hospital, and last year I did this about probably five or six uh, locations. I started at 9 o'clock, and, you know, I was done like by 2 o'clock. And with every one of these, I just uh, listened to their story. I, I served them communion. You know, we, we prayed together. Um, you know, and the message of Christmas is that God is with us, and I wanted them to experience that God was with them. Now, I don't know, I don't know what it did for any of these people. I assume they were at least partially blessed by it. But I know, for me, um, you know, I was connected to these people like I've never been connected to them before. You know, to show up in the room of a hospital person, they don't even know you're coming, and it, it, it's, it's more of a blessing for me. But the blessing is because there's this connection that happens, and connection happens when we serve other people. Now, you can do this. You don't have to go serve them communion on Christmas Eve. But the way that we can do this is we built this bridge. And you want to be connected to somebody. The way that we do this is we serve. You know, we, we love, we give extravagantly with, with absolutely no strings attached. You know, this becomes a blessing because of the connection that is developed. Now, another way is... Uh, uh, being stubborn is, is, is a wall. Um, it is. It's just a wall. Um, being compassionate, um, being a learner, that's going to be a bridge. Now, let's do this one. Does anyone here know any stubborn people? It's a quick show of hands. Does anyone sitting by a stubborn person? <laughs> Get your hand down. I don't want to cause you any problems. <laughs> now, think about this. So, like, isn't it really tough to want to be deeply connected um, to someone that's really stubborn and someone that has to be right all the time. Now, we want to be connected to someone who's compassionate. You know, stubborn says, I'm right, you're wrong. Compassion says, you hurt and I hurt. You know, learning says, uh, I don't know, why don't you help me understand? You know, one of them builds a really high fortified wall. The other builds a really cool bridge. Now, the last one I'm going to look at um, is listening to respond builds a wall. Listening to understand builds a bridge. Have you ever like talked to someone before and um, you can just like see their mind working, their wheels are spinning, they're trying to figure out what they're going to say back to you. Um, and then you've also listened to someone and they're just they're just there to understand you. You know, they want to hear your story, they want to hear where you're coming from. And I think one of the great ways to build a bridge in life is to listen. You know, to connect yourself to them through their story, not to judge, not to uh, uh, admonish, just to listen and understand. Now I'll say this, even if all our human relationships are absolutely perfect, which that's not going to be the case for any of us, but even if they all are, 
I still think there's a pretty good chance that we're going to experience some loneliness because we are created to live in a relationship with the creator of the universe. Now, the Grinch, um, his life changed near the end of the movie, and we're going to see what happened in the Grinch's life. Every who done it will, the tall and the small, were singing without any presence at all. <laughs> Hadn't stopped Christmas from coming. It came. Somehow or other, it came just the same. It's the Grinch! And the Grinch, with his Grinch feet, ice cold in the snow, stood puzzling and puzzling. How could it be so? It came without ribbons. It came without tags. It came without packages, boxes, or bags. And he puzzled and puzzled till his puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. Maybe Christmas. He thought. Don't. What happened then? Well, in Whoville, they say that the Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day. Yeah, so one of the things they said is that uh, Chris, what if Christmas doesn't come from a store? Um, yeah, what if it's something that's a whole lot more? It says the Grinch's uh, heart grew three sizes that day. Now, Ecclesiastes, he concludes in... Uh, in verse 12, uh, when he says that a cord of three strands is not easily broken. And what he is talking about here is like when we have these like human relationships, these, these life-giving human relationships, um, where someone understands us, when someone embraces us, when, when someone loves us, when someone gives themselves to us, when we combine that with a relationship with God, um, he says, it's this beautiful illustration that it's not easily broken. Now, there is a place in our heart that is reserved only and specifically for the love of God. We are going to feel lonely until that heart issue is uh, resolved. Now, we can be around our best friend. We can be around our newest friend. We can be around our oldest friend. We can be around the person that we love the most. But there is still a place missing in our hearts if God's love is not filling it. Now, the psalmist knew this. So the deer is at the water's edge. And what the psalmist says in uh, chapter 42, verse 1, As the deer longs for the streams of water, so I long for you, O God. I thirst for God, the living God. Now, an early bishop in the Catholic Church, uh, St. Augustine, he wrote the following, You have made us for yourself, um, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds rest in you. So let us pray. <clears throat> 